Do you want to you want to get up and move around for a second? No, we're gonna do we're gonna do the Dale Carnegie thing. You got this. You got this. You got this. You got this. There we go. All right, thank you. No problem. You're not drinking at all. Yes, I'm drinking plenty. Thank you. And the area. He's not drinking at all. I am drinking. If you were looking at Judaism from a historical perspective, that was the central location of everything that happened. Judaism wants equal rights for all peoples to pray on the Temple Mount. Hi, welcome to Wine with Adam. I'm your host, Adam Scott Bellows. And today, oh, we have a very special episode for you, filming in a very special location at the historic Turo restaurant here in the city of Jerusalem, overlooking the walls of the old city. And I want to say thank you for them to opening up their doors to us today. Uh, today, on Wine with Adam, I have a very special guest, Rabbi Yehuda Levy. But before I introduce you, Rabbi, we are going to taste uh, some wine. Today, on Wine with Adam, we have a very, very, very special wine. One of my favorite Israeli wines, one of the most affordable Israeli wines by one of the best winemakers in Israel, the Shiloh Privilege. And since we're going to be talking so much about the Temple Mount today, I figured that it would be only appropriate to bring you wine that was from the original place that the tabernacle stood prior to the dedication of Jerusalem. All right. And Lahayim. Okay. Oh, wow. Rabbi, thank you so much for joining me. Today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I want to introduce you to our viewers very quickly. Uh, Rabbi, you are originally from New Jersey. Correct. You're a father of four. Correct. Okay. Thank you're, God. You're also a husband. Yes. Okay. You've studied rabbinic and Talmudic law. Correct. Okay. And were ordained in 2020. Yep. Correct. That's correct. Also is director of outreach at the Yeshiva Harabai and a founding member of that Yeshiva as well, which is a huge part of your work as well. Definitely. Something kind of changed in the air of Israel, which was people demanding the right to have access to the Temple Mount. Uh, and if I'm correct, your organization specializes in bringing people up to the Temple Mount in order to pray up there. I'd love to know how this began and where you got the idea for it. Okay, well, so let's unpack it here. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for including me in this this very fun show and for the wine. Oh, well, I, if I have an opportunity to drink with you, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm not going to pass it up. It's delicious. So... Um, I was studying under a Lawrence Kellerman, who has an amazing program for rabbinical, you know, for rabbinical law and trained rabbis called the Center for Kill Development. And I was in there from, I believe, 2016 to 2020, right around when COVID hit is when I graduated. Um, and this was in Israel. This is in Israel. And it's a five-year intensive program where it's basically like, I think Rabbi Kellerman likes to bill it as the Navy SEAL of rabbinic training. It's insanely intense. They... 8.45 till, you know, until 7.30 at night with like a 40-minute break in between. And it's, it's straight all day. We cover a tremendous amount of, of Jewish law and Talmud as well and undergo all sorts of training such as, uh, you know, marriage counseling training and parenting training and the like. Um, and one of the goals of that rabbinical training program is that the rabbis that come out of there, just as they receive uh, uh, about five years of training they have to dedicate their lives for five years to giving something back to um giving something back to the to the jewish nation and many of the graduates go out to different places around the world and accept positions there whether it's in Chinuch, which is running schools or rabbinics and we have rabbis in montreal and and, uh, and uh, other places in canada and all across the united states some here in israel and um when i was looking for a t an opportunity to really take the training and go with it some, uh, you know, go take it and do something for the Jewish nation. Um, the, the, the specific opportunity that arose at the time was Harabayat. And Harabayat was a topic that I had been researching for many years. Um, I already received a, a Psaq Halakha, a religious ruling to go up. 
um, because there are many rabbis who say not to go up. Because this is a, it's a very controversial thing for a Smichud Haredi rabbi to go up to the Temple Mount, let alone bring people up there. You've started with a small group of people. Now we're at over 100 people going up every day. So in a way, I'm the first of my kind to do what I'm doing, but I'm actually really building off of a lot more people and, and, and people way before me. We applaud the rabbis who, in their great care of the holiness of the site, set out to us to, to ban Jews from going to that area. But what has led to the reality that the exact opposite, their, their goal of safeguarding the place and the holiness of the site has led to the exact opposite reaction. So a little while ago, you published an article on the history of the Jewish connection to the Temple Mount in the Daily Wire. Um, and uh, one of the things that I found absolutely fascinating as somebody with a Judaic studies background, you basically laid out that there's been a, a almost a 2,500 year unbroken chain of connection, worship, and visiting of the Temple Mount by the Jewish people, including uh, Maimonides. Yes. Well, I, I would love to ask you about your relationship with the CEO of Daily Wire, but I'll just say I know that recently you did take him and Dr. Jordan Peterson up to the Temple Mount yourself with your organization, which was caused quite an international stir, especially because of Jordan Peterson. Um, uh, yeah, well, the, we facilitated that tour. We didn't actually give them that tour. We facilitated that. Um, I have taken Ben multiple times. Now, when the last... Uh, the, Two years ago, I believe, and during Ramadan, there was it was uh, Ramadan fell out of during the Hebrew month of Iyar, which is also the, day, the time of year that we celebrate Yom Yerushalayim or Jerusalem Day. And there was a whole hullabaloo about that Jerusalem Day because the Jewish people that were, the, you know, the Jewish uh, ascenders were scandalized, and on the very day that we celebrate retaking the old city, um, Jewish worshippers were not and visitors would not be allowed onto the Temple Mount. Because of Ramadan. Because of Ramadan. And because the Israeli government views the Temple Mount as a Muslim holy site where non-Muslims are allowed to visit but not pray, officially according to their policy. Therefore, on Muslim holidays, they have the right to close the Temple Mount to non-Muslims. So during that time, during Ramadan, when there was uh, the Hamas terrorist organization gave an ultimatum to, to the Israeli government at the time saying that if you allow... Jews to go up to the Temple Mount on Jerusalem Day during Ramadan, and or you allow the flag march to to go through the certain areas of Jerusalem, we will shoot rockets and start a war. And which a war, and a war they did start. literally did that and shot a rocket at Jerusalem, which thank God did not make it anywhere close to the city. But that set off the Israeli response, which turned into a full blown war. During that time, the Temple Mount was very much in the news, and there were many people saying that it's all about the Jewish, the, these pesky Jews, they want to go visit this Islamic shrine, why they're bothering, why they're making a ruckus, what's going on here? And I received a phone call from Ben, Ben Shapiro of uh, the Daily Wire, who asked me, he's like, Yehuda, this is your field, can you write an article showcasing how the Temple Mount is in fact the holiest spot in Judaism and is the thing that ties us all together? Um, and I hope I did justice in that article. It took me about two weeks to really put it down to a pen to paper and do a lot of research. Although I had a lot of notes on it, and, and I was able to, you know, to formulate it into that, into that, uh, to that it was ready to go out. Right. Um, like you said, from the times of David in the 10th century BCE, we have a clear, a clear, Masora tradition path, historical path we can trace back till that time that Jews and their religion had a connection to the Temple Mount. There were many times where Jews were allowed to visit but not pray. There were many times where Jews were not allowed to visit but still kept it in their minds and kept the knowledge. Um, and there are pockets in history when there were no Jews here at all. But they kept this not the, the knowledge was able to be preserved due to certain landmarks that were already been put onto the Temple Mount. So, for example, the, the, the longest tradition in Judaism is that the, currently the Dome of the Rock sits over the site of the Holy of Holies. That's the longest tradition in it, Judaism? That's one of the longest traditions in Judaism, that the place where the Dome of the Rock currently sits on is the site of the Holy of Holies. Okay? It's easy to back such a thing up. The one thing that is not debated by the rabbis is the knowledge where the temple stood. Even rabbis who are vociferously opposed to Jewish visitation today on the Temple Mount all agree that the location where the temple stood on the Temple Mount is not to be debated. It is very well, very clear. 
Rabbi David ben Zimmer, who was the chief rabbi of Cairo in the late in the early 1500s, he was the rabbi of the Ari, which was the famous Rabbi Isaac Luria, the famous Kabbalist. He was also, also the who rabbi was in Svat. who lived in Svat. Um, he also was the rabbi of Rabbi Yosef Cairo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, the, pr- the premier uh, code of Jewish law. Um, he was at some point came to visit Jerusalem right at the beginning of the Ottoman conquest. And he wrote a responsa as to where Jews were allowed to visit on the Temple Mount. And he writes, There is no doubt underneath the dome, there lies the Evan Hashtia, the rock of consumption, the first thing God created when he created this world, um, that is called by them, meaning in Arabic, al Sahra, the Sahra stone. And if you take a quick Google search or ask your Arab taxi driver next time he's driving you around and you say, which one is Al-Aqsa and which one's al Sahra?" I'll be very happy to show you that the, that the small building to the, you know, all the way to the south of the Temple Mount with its small gray dome is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And the, and the beautiful gold building, the gold dome, the dome of the rock, is known as the Sahra building or Kubat al Sahra in Arabic. That is not... Rabbi, Rabbi David ben Zimra, the Radvaz, was not, was not the one to introduce this concept. This concept predates him far, far earlier. Between the destruction of the Second Temple and today, was there an unbroken chain of Jewish visitation? Uh, for Fred- the most part, until there were certain times that they weren't able to. How about Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount? So Jewish prayer, so this is where it really gets fascinating to look for. So during the Byzantine, Roman slash Byzantine times, or we we mentioned Bar Kokhba, prior to Bar Kokhba, the Talmud tells us some multiple stories of rabbis who visited the Temple Mount, and even after Bar Kokhba, through the different Byzantine emperors, some were more pro, some were, were less pro, but there were visitations to some degree. There were certain times that Jewish, Jewish visitation was restricted to Tisha B'Av on the, the, ninth of, the ninth of Av, the day that we the date that the temple was burned, um, and people would go there to cry. There, there the pilgrim of Bordeaux writes about that, and they saw the Jews would come to the rock and cry over there. Um, after the Byzantine Empire fell, and, and the Persians reconquered reconquered Jerusalem for a short period of time. There was a false messiah who came along with them um, and until he was killed. But there were many Jews that came up to the Temple Mount that they were trying to bring. When was this? This was in the year 615, give or take. The, the Persian, the Persian conquer, uh, conquerance of Jerusalem didn't last. It went back in the Byzantine hands until the Umayyad Caliphate uh, captured Jerusalem in the year 638. The Dome of the Rock, which was built and completed in the year 692, was originally built by the Umayyads and Abd al-Malik uh, over the very site of the, whole, of the Holy of Holies. And according to some Jewish writings, there was actually a, syn- a synagogue that existed on the Temple Mount at that time. Now, the building stayed under, uh, under the Umayyad period, and there were definitely a synagogue on the Temple Mount during that time. And for the most part, barring a few incidents, Jews were allowed to regularly visit the Temple Mount and pray on the Temple Mount and some even suggested the Dome of the Rock was used as a synagogue at, to, some, to some degree, although that's not in accordance with all opinions. Now, the tradition was that Jews prayed in and around the area of the Dome. At that point, once the Crusaders in 1099 took, uh, captured Jerusalem and they actually converted the building of the Dome of the Rock into a church, and the Al-Aqsa Mas, which was completed in 715, um, they, com- they converted both buildings into churches. I did not know that i thought they built new structures no they converted those into, into churches which will then when the mamluks retook the the areas they converted them into they converted them out of churches the al-aqsa mosque is still the only mosque on the temple mount the dome of the rock is viewed as a shrine to muhammad and uh, muhammad's ascent and as you mentioned according to some scholar, muslim scholars and this is the opinion that dr mordechai Kedar brings very often um, which is based on certain Saudi scholars and Islamic scholars, which suggests that the reason why the Dome of the Rock was used, it was sort of used as a, as a supplement hajj, uh, a place to visit, because the, uh, one of the things Muslims, religious Muslims need to do is they go visit Mecca. They replaced that and made the Dome of the Rock, the rock inside there, the Sacra Stone, as a temporary hajj place. Um, but once the Crusaders and the Mamluks then took over, after that, we end up herring, having a period where many Jews visited, still visited the Temple Mount. Okay? The, it was only when the Ottoman, the Sultan Suleiman of the Ottoman Empire captured Jerusalem in the 1500s did he start creating rules that were exclusively, uh, exclusive for Muslims. And that's when the Jews started to pray off the Temple Mount to a small alleyway on the western side of the wall. This idea that the Western Wall is the holiest for Jews is actually only roughly about 500 years old. So 
the the area specifically that small window of that western wall is only due to muslim subjugation against the jewish nation which historically they were not so you're you're saying that jewish connection to the western wall comes specifically from being banned by muslims to, to enter, enter the temple mount or to play on the eastern side and that prayer at the western wall is a sign of one uh, demi status yep uh n non full citizenship correct lack of sovereignty correct okay and being banned yep from your holiest site and, and, like, and, and like, to take the like, step further is that correct that, that you're is kind of like correct. summing that up in that statement very right true there? and it goes even further because to the muslim world and to the uh, to islamic faith the western wall of the temple mount is actually a holy spot for muslims it's the al barak wall it's the place where muhammad tied his steed when did that come into play um it came into play from the time that the, that's a legitimate division. claim yeah. that muslims have had for yeah. since six let's say 15 yeah since they are since the the vision of or the opinion that the uh, the that muhammad sajira took place from the the location in jerusalem um so once we get to the ottoman period that's when we start seeing these laws against jews visiting the temple mount and that that lasts from the 1500s till the end of the crimean war and when the ottoman empire suffered losses at the crimean war one of the things they had to um, they had to, one of their con their concessions they had to make was to allow non-Muslim visitation to the Temple Mount. After the Crimean War, certain famous Jewish pers personages uh, went up to the Temple Mount, including Moses Montefiore. He visited the Temple Mount. After that, you have Baron Rothschild, who came up um, and, and to, and to, uh, who visited the Temple Mount in 1914, right before World War I. After World War I, you have the, uh, the British taking over. And once the British took over, it was a little bit of a free-for-all. Many Jews were, were going to the Temple Mount, and a lot of Jews at that point were not religious, and they would not they didn't seem to care for the for the the boundaries of where the temple stood on the Temple Mount. It wasn't really important for them, and there were people going into the Dome of the Rock and all those areas, which is what led the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Hakohen Cook, to put a ban on going to visit the Temple Mount. Now, Rabbi Cook himself mentioned in writings, and his family have very clearly stated that his ban was only to the area where the temple stood on the Temple Mount. Not the Temple Mount in itself. So that's a very big misconception that yes. Rav Cook's ban is not to the Temple Mount, but really to the Dome of the Rock. To the Temple area of the Temple Mount, right. which encompasses the Dome of the Rock and some other additional area. You'll see the Dome of the Rock, and then around it is an extended type of platform that's on top of it, and that's what I'm referring to. Correct. After the Jordanians captured the old city in 1948, there was, it wasn't practical to discuss whether one should go to the Temple Mount or not. Um, but in 1967, when the paratroopers captured the Temple Mount in great miracles, they, people, the, the, the gates were open. People were going all over. Basically, in short, any ban that has been issued by any rabbi in the last hundred years has really been about preventing people who don't care or are disregarding the importance of the area. Right. Okay. And has been because they don't want Jews entering to the areas that we know, not that we don't know, that we know are the forbidden area, which is basically where the temple physically building stood. Correct. So about seven years ago, I actively started getting involved with um, Yeshiva Tarabai. Yeshiva okay. Tarabai was... And now you're the director of outreach for uh, yes. Yeshiva. No, I serve as the director of outreach for them. Okay. So the Yeshiva had one goal. There, There's a verse in Isaiah that says... Uh, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. There is a stated goal in Judaism that the place, the ideal place that was chosen by God for communication with God was the, the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, the place of the Evan Hashtia. And because that every human being was created in the Tzalem Elohim, in the, the image of God, has that human right to communicate with their creator, the primary place of doing so would be on the Harabayat, on the Temple Mount, which is why, as Isaiah prophesies, at the end of days, I will bring you to my holy mountain and I'll gladden you in my house of prayer. My house of, pray my house of prayer shall be a house of prayer for all nations. This is something unique to Judaism. Judaism wants equal rights for all peoples to pray on the Temple Mount. This is not exclusive to Jews. And I think this is something that a lot of people have misconceptions about the Jewish uh, advocacy over there. The greatest place 
for service of God, the undisputed place, the place that God himself is guaranteed, and we find in verses throughout the Tanakh and through the Talmud, is the Temple Mount. What if you don't believe in God? While the secular Israeli establishment likes to believe that we have returned to our land and we and we have the right to be here, and this is you know this is our thing, they want to do it up to the point of the Temple and the Temple service. They don't want to actually have to deal with the political reality of having a temple because the temple means that it's going to be a religious kingdom. Religious kingdom has a religious priest, a high priest. And as they well, don't you think you could have, I don't really want to get into the semantic list, but don't you think you could build the temple and still have a democratic nation? Yes, I think we can. Um, but I mean, we don't need a king in look, order I'm to not, build I'm, the I'm temple. Not, I'm not a political, I'm not a polit- this, is not, this is not my field. I'm not a, 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 a politician or no politics enough to give my opinion on it. So I just feel I study and I try very much to stay in my lane. What I could say is, is that as a layman, it's hard to separate the fact that when you hear of a Jewish country with a Jewish temple and the service of the temple, which has all sorts of interesting things like animal sacrifices and, and, um, and rituals and, and things where everything was at the center of the temple, you can appreciate why someone who doesn't is not knowledgeable and it would be a little bit scared off by that, <laughs> right? If you were looking at Judaism from a historical perspective, from the back end when we originally were here in this land as the, during the times of Solomon and David, where they definitely did believe in God and they had a temple dedicated to a service, that was the central location of everything that happened in the, in, in, during the Davidic uh, area of, Jude- of Judea. Um, our goal is to elevate it and to and to ascend and to destigmatize it, to make it normal. To be, it should be normalized, in uh, it should be normalized in its scope. It should be something that is important to every citizen of this country. Have you seen a change? Of course, we've seen changes. So, two years ago when you started, how many people were going up every day? Um, the numbers had already um, went up since the since the Shiva had done its incredible work and still continues to do its incredible work. But have you seen a number increase in visitation? To... Definitely. And just in the year of January alone, we, we had over 100 tours. Uh, we, we were taking a tremendous amount. Uh, our numbers are growing, thank God, and we're doing, uh, we're seeing a lot of other visitors coming to the Temple Mount. I would like to ask you my final question. It's the question that everybody uh, gets on this program. Mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to study for my bar mitzvah and become a bar mitzvah. If you could sum up everything that you've learned in one sentence, what would it be? If you're a bar mitzvah boy and you're you're looking to summarize everything in Judaism, is that love your fellow man as yourself. Treat people with respect. Treat people the way you want to be respected. Everything comes from that. Our connection to God, our connection to to the land of Israel, our connection to life itself comes from this idea that we are the chosen nation, we are the Amun Ibchar, and we have to set an example for everybody. It's our job to set a standard that everybody wants to emulate. The way we act with people, the way we interact with people, and the way we treat one another is crucial. That was beautiful. Behind that. I would like to thank Rabbi Levy for joining me on Wine with Adam today. I would also like to thank Sheila Winery for providing this wine for us. And if you like the wine uh, that we are drinking today, the Shilo Privilege 2021, you can find it at wineonthevine.com. And if you want to plant a vine with the Shilo Winery, you can plant it at wineonthevine.org slash JNS. And uh, don't forget, when you're drinking your Israeli wine, drink it with somebody you love. The high impulse.